Welcome to EPG Pachala. I'm Sandesha Raipa from JNU's Linguistic Empowerment Cell. And today we will be discussing on the module on text in history, George Lucas and Terry Eagleton. So what exactly is this module about? This module introduces you to the connection in between literary texts and history. Also in this module, you will learn about two major theorists, George Lucas and Terry Eagleton, and their major theoretical formations. Further, we will discuss some important texts written by these two personalities. And in this way, you will come to know how the arguments are interconnected and involved with each other. Further, you will be introduced to how these two figures have criticized theory formations of themselves. From these, we will try to draw a larger picture of literary theory and criticism around involved uh, these two people in connection with the world of that time. Now, beginning with the introduction, um, Terry Eagleton in his book, After Theory, notes the demise of literary criticism in literary studies since mid 20th century. Its place was taken over by cultural criticism in theory. Now, historian Eric Hobson had also noted the fact in his book, The 20th Century, A Short History in the Demise of Literary History. In fact, the literary text was once seen as a historical testament of a time. Thus, Boswell's Life of Samuel Johnson, or uh, the first, for Evans' short history of English literature, were not just a histories of a literary tradition or individual author's contribution there, to, but were pres presumed to provide historical knowledge of the development of a culture and the text and authentic sense of the milieu. This idea was premised upon the univers universality of literature its aesthetic capacity to transcend barriers of space and time appeals to everybody. So text in history, coming to that topic, Terry Eagleton in Literary Theory, an introduction notes the cliche, literature as a mirror of society and adds, if literature is indeed a mirror, it stands at an angle to reality and thus is at best a broken mirror, incorrectly reflecting impressions contorting them according to its whims and ideological persuasions. The text together with the author is a product of a particular time, not just like any other object. This transformation in our conception of literature is one of the signal insights of 20th century scholarship. And if we need to talk of pioneers, Lucas provides the earliest incitement to this trend. George Lucas, uh, born in 1885, died in 1971, his life and career. If we assume the world of letters to be factored by various boundaries of language, geography, and different histories of cultural production, then we might understand why texts and ideas have varying non-linear histories of dissemination and effect of them in cultures removed from their original sites of production. These factors are governed by rules of the publication industry, current tastes in different reading cultures, and of course, the perceived political relevance of the issues at stake. This is more so for emigres and writers in exile like Marx or Victor Serge. Likewise, George Lucas' ideas has had a very different reception in the Anglo-American world than the original context of publication of these texts. His landmark theoretical writings were composed between 1909 and the beginning of World War II. His landmark theoretical writings were composed between 1909 and the beginning of World War II. Lucas was born in erstwhile Austro Austro-Hungarian Empire in 1888. He studied political science at the University of Budapest, from where he graduated in 1909. His dissertation, History of the Modern Drama, was his first major work and he took up the concerns of life and form that he deals in this text to develop in his subsequent works up till History in Class, Consciousness in 1923. It must be noted that this period also coincides with his fervent communist activism, starting as a young idealist foot soldier, eventually becoming a party bureaucrat in the short-lived Hungarian Socialist Republic. His relation with the Communist Party hierarchy had been an issue of dispute within the European left, as he was seen to detract and compromise his scholastic foundations to allegedly conform to regime dictates. 
Some of the inconsistencies between his earlier works like theory of the novel or history and class consciousness with his later works like the historical novel in 1923 is perceived to stem from these conditions. Lucas' major writing phase ranged from the 1910s with the German publications of the history of the modern drama in 1909 till the end of 1930s. The English translation of them came out after World War II in the 1950s and some in 1960s. However, Lucas had been recognized as a major Marxist philosopher by the early 1920s with the German publication of The Theory of the Novel in 1916 and History and Class Consciousness in 1923. So Lucas can be said to have had two lives in his import over the Anglo-American literary criticism world. His formulation of a reputedly non-dogmatic Marxism self-consciously transforming the world and the idea that the literary text is a powerful indicator of the relations or disjunctions thereof between individual life and what he calls form of social life in a particular social setting was heard of. But without knowledge of German or French or Russian, very few could access them. While his second life, starting with the translation of his studies in European realism in 1950 followed by the historical novel 12 years later in the milieu of the rise of British cultural theory and American new criticism had very different kind of vibrations. Lucas in German or Hungarian in the interwar years was seen as a pioneer in literary criticism method. His reading of text with the larger concern of identifying the disjunction between the individual life and life form, which the literary text is supposed to contain traces of the disjunction. While the English uh, Lucas in tandem with similar translations of the works of Gramsci, which came out in the same period, was noted for his unorthodox handling of the issue of ideology and his concept of uh, reification in modern capitalist society, which he identifies as the prime lacuna of capitalist society. Some important works of Lucas. In History of the Modern Drama in 1909 and Philosophy of Art in 1912, Lucas is concerned about the relation between life and form. More specifically, there is the added consideration, how does form determine art as a separate sphere of value? For instance, in the first book, he analyzes Homeric epic and concludes that there was no disjunction between individual life and collective life form during the era of the Homeric epic. This he distinguishes from the following Hellenic Jetgeist, the era of the great Greek tragedies. According to him, tragedies are conceived at that moment when the individual life cannot conform to the life form which creates the tragic quotient. One central concern that runs throughout Lucas is about totality in life, that is the entire complex of interrelated elements of which the meaning of any single constituent depends on its relation to the entire set. Same theoretical persuasion informs his next major work, The Theory of the Novel in 1916. Writing in the midst of an unprecedented global war, the novels he discusses seldom remains the object of analysis. Lucas deals with the novels as refractions of the societies in which the novels are produced. History and class consciousness in 1923 was a product of Lucas' activist days and concern is not literature proper, not even literature as an object of study to gain insight on larger social for forces, but individual and society's relation to their particular consciousness. The mode of formation of such consciousness, the attendant dialectics in that process, and of course the formation of ideologies and maintenance of ruling, class hegemony, literary production is given a merely functional role in the production and generation of ideologies. The period between writing history and class consciousness and the historical novel was a period of fervent political writings in Lucas' career, most of them ephemeral, topical and engage in immediate debates of contemporary European politics. His last major work, the historical novel in 1937, thus stands at a distance from his earlier theoretical positions and indeed it contradicts his own formulations of the theory of the novel and history and class consciousness. Now there is criticism against Lucas. It needs to be remembered that Lucas was a political activist too.
and at times his larger theoretical objectives had to be adjusted, compromised and earlier theoretical positions were retracted for reasons of political Im imminence. So at a time when the proper subject of socialist art was an issue of fractious dispute among communists, Lucas was attacked both from the Stalinistic Zanovian position for his perceived reticence regarding socialist realism and by the left opposition to anti-Stalinism for his disinterested of, uh, disinterest of modernist art. Okay, so there was criticism against Lucas. It needs to be remembered that Lucas was a political activist too and at times his larger theoretical objectives had to be adjusted, compromised and earlier theoretical positions were retracted for reasons of political eminence. At a time when the proper subject of socialist art was an issue of fractions dispute among communists, Lucas was attacked both from the Stalinistic Zanovian position for his perceived reticence regarding socialist realism and by the left opposition to anti-Stalinism for his disinterest of modernist art. Noted anti-Stalinist Marxist playwright Berthold Brecht criticized him for his constant harking back to the 19th century literary realism. Be like Balzac, only up to date, was Brecht's sardonic paraphrasing of Lucas' position. Brecht criticized Lucas' prescription of 19th century literary realism as the form for a literature of social transformation as a fetishization. Brecht points out Lucas' uh, eloquence of the historical formation of literary forms. To Brecht, Forms have an integral relation with the specifics of literary production and a particular form emerged in certain spatio-temporal location cannot be replicated in some other random context. Lukacs uh, considered Brecht's criticism to be decadent formalism to which Brecht's counter was that Lukacs had created a very limited and unduly formalist definition of realism itself. Eagleton had pointed out that Lukacs uh, Theorization of ideology has the contradictory features of a ideology as the worldview of different classes and in that way are autonomous, yet he talks of b the act of insinuating a certain class ideology as a hegemony like the bourgeois ensuring its own ideology to be hegemonic as the ideology of the ruling class. The problem might be deeper in Lukacs formulation of the class subject itself. Uh, being fashioned by ideology. His 1937 book, historical novel, written under severe pressure to conform to Stalinist dictators, refers his formulations in history and class consciousness. Indeed, the 1937 book happens to be his last major work as he progressively became an academic bureaucrat from then on. Now, if you look at Lukács' uh, theories in connection to world affairs of the time, Taking us to the next subtopic, which is uh, Lukács' theories in connection to world affairs of the time. During the Popular Front period, the international socialist impulse to forge a larger alliance with the liberal bourgeois was evident in his writings. In the historical novel, his strained attempts of appraising minor anti-fascist novelists is an offshoot of this pressure to uphold the vague, incompletely conceived liberal tenet of democracy in place of his erstwhile theoretical persuasion of revolutionary socialism. The historical novel remains one of Lukács most enduring works. Lukács sees Marxism critical tradition as part of the larger milieu of 19th century bourgeois humanism in its origin and also in their kindred concern against the then rising tide of fascism in interwar Europe. This politics of immediacy sits awkwardly with his larger theoretical position regarding ideology in literature. In history and class consciousness in 1923, the classes are assumed to have differing ideologies, autonomous, formative of their contentious worldviews. Lukacs admits the dynamic nature of forces that constitute ideologies and the power of literature as a tool for espousing and refashioning ideologies to mold the ruling class hegemony out of dominant ideologies. However, to him, ideology is also a component of an individual's social relations, not just a misinformed form of consciousness to be dismissed as false, as his contemporary Stalinist counterparts were doing. Lukacs regarding the literary work as a spontaneous whole which reconciles the capitalist contradictions between essence and appearance 
concrete and abstract, individual and social whole. In overcoming these alienations, art recreates wholeness and harmony. Brecht, however, believes this to be reactionary nostalgia. Art for him should expose rather than remove those contradictions, thus stimulating men to abolish them in real life. This brings us to Terry Eagleton, um, from, born in 1943, his life and career. Terry Eagleton is a professor chair at the Department of English and Creative Writing at Lancaster University. The internationally celebrated literary scholar and cultural theorist started his ac academic career as a Victorian critic. He works in the history and literature of the 19th and 20th century literatures. His specialities are literary and cultural theory and the English language literature and culture. He is also becoming rather more broadly involved in comparative literature and a recent book on tragedy considers the literature of various European cultures. Eagleton obtained his PhD at Cambridge where he was a student of the famous left-wing literary critic Raymond Williams. He then became a fellow of Jesus College, Cambridge, the youngest fellow since the 18th century, before moving to Wadham College, Oxford in 1968. Later, he was John Edward Taylor, Professor of English Literature at the University of Manchester and Thomas Wharton, Professor of English Literature at the University of Oxford. Professor Eagleton, who has written around 50 books, is one of the world's leading literary critics and according to The Independent, the man who succeeded F. R. Lewis as Britain's most influential academic critic. It was though his more theoretical work as a Marxist critic which established him as a leading figure within literary studies. Some of his notable works include Shakespeare and Society in 1967, The New Left Church in 1968, Exiles and Emigres, Studies in Modern Literature in 1970, Myths of Power, a Marxist study of the Bronze in 1975, uh, Criticism and Ideology in 1976, Literary Theory and Introduction in, in 1983, The Function of Criticism in 1984, The Ideology of the Aesthetic in 1990, the idea of the culture in 2000 in after theory in 2003. Further, he is also the author of the novel Saints and Scholars in 1987 and The Gatekeeper, a memoir in 2001. His latest books include Reason, Faith and Revolution, Reflections on the God Debate in 2009, Why Marx Was Right in 2011, The Event of Literature in 2012, How to Read Literature in 2013, Culture and the Death of God in 2014 and Hope Without Optimism in 2015. In the 1980s, Eagleton engaged extensively with the various styles of continental thought that were impacting upon English literature and he did so most famously in his book Literary Theory in 1983, which remains to this day an academic bestseller. Eagleton's specifically Marxist take on literary theory is evident throughout this book and clearly informs his continuing work on ideology, most famously the ideology of the aesthetic in 1990, and his critique of the postmodern turn in cultural theory, witness the illusions of postmodernism in 1996, and indeed his more recent work, Why Marx Was Right in 2011. There are important works of Eagleton that we will be talking about now. Criticism and Ideology in 1976 was a big break in Eagleton's career. Departing uh, from previous concerns of traditional Marxist literary criticism and theology, Eagleton embarks upon situating the author and the literary text within the domain of production. He analyzed the course of 20th century English literary criticism from F.R. Lewis to Ronald Williams, Pierre Macquarie, and formulated a materialistic criticism of the literary mode of production and ideology. His focus is on the social premises of the Victorian novel and its constitutive influence on the form of the literary text. Coming to literary theory and introduction in 1983, which was revised in 1996, probably his best known work, traces the history of the study of the text, from the romantics of the 19th century to the post-modernists of the late 20th century. Eagleton's approach to literary criticism remains firmly rooted in the Marxian tradition, though he has also in incorporated techniques and ideas from more recent modes of thought as structuralism, Lacanian analysis and deconstruction. In the ideology of the aesthetic in 1990, he embarks on a massive project to chart the history of aesthetics in Western thought, 
In the process, he lays out the moral and political underpinnings of aesthetics. He discusses the various philosophical positions regarding the concept ranging from Spinoza to Kant to Marx to Nietzsche and Heidegger in order to unravel aesthetics prevalent mysticism. His ideology in, in an introduction 1991 sets out to provide a history to ideology in an era obsessed with the possibility of the end of ideology. 25 years from the publication of this book, such messianic claims of end of ideology seems idiosyncratic. Such uh, objects of Eagleton's criticism seem irrelevant, topical, far off. However, the veracity of the book both in its historical comprehensiveness and the analytical rigor that he brings in the study of ideology makes it an essential reading regarding the concept. After theory in 2003 represents a kind of about face, an indictment of current cultural and literary theory. He traces the evolution of cultural theory from the mid 50s to the 90s, applauding its achievement, but more than that, declaiming its shortcomings. As he perceives the ushering in of postmodernism and the resultant effacement of the subject had led cultural theory to overlook issues like truth, fundamentalism, objectivity, coercion or inequality, issues which Eagleton as a Marxist considers to be important. There was criticism of Terry Eagleton. Terry Eagleton might be the only Marxist critic who also happens to be a professed Catholic. True. Latin American liberation theology do have eclectic fusion of Marxism and biblical thought, but rarely do we find a theorist who tries to accommodate these two astoundingly divergent theoretical positions in their work. Statements like to equate communism with the Stalinistic totalitarianism is to reduce the history of Christianity with the ex excesses of the Inquisition does not cohere with his usually rigorous rigorous materialist criticism. Critics had also pointed to his inconsistent handling of the base superstructure distinction in Marx's thought. In places he had taken base to be, the de to be the determining factor of a given relation of production, like in ideology and introduction, which in places he had taken it to be a relation in category. Nonetheless, his materialist criticism is a singular contribution in the Anglo-American literary scholarship. He upholds a tradition of literary criticism at a time when the reigning theoretical mold is cultural theory, though he acknowledges his debt to formative cultural studies theorists. It is to be noted that the Lukacs in English translation technically becomes a near contemporary of Terry Eagleton, born in 1943. And Eagleton's critique of Lukacs, especially Lukacs' conception of ideology, is an original contribution of English Marxism. And now, coming to the summary of the module. So in this module, you are introduced to the subject of literary texts and its relation with history. At the beginning, we have discussed some basic theories related to the topic of the module. Further, we have focused on two theorists, George Lukacs and Terry Eagleton, and their contribution to the field of study. We have also analyzed some of their works and theoretical formations. Later on, you have seen how arguments of these two theorists are interconnected and how their theories invoke with one another. Further, we have discussed what other critics have said about the formations of Lukacs and Eagleton. Also, we have seen issues with their theories and how those connect with social issues and happenings of the world affair of the time. Hope these will be useful for your studies. If you have any more references that you would like to know about, kindly visit the website of uh, EPG Pachala. Thank you.